It's a great pleasure to be here. I've really uh, enjoyed this week in, in Savannah. Appreciate the invitation to come. I want to take up for where, uh, in the same historical note that uh, Hamish introduced, to discuss uh, double beta decay in the context of early developments and weak interactions. So I'll try to take you through the connections between lepton number and neutrino masses, the connections with other tests we have today of uh, neutrino mass, and uh, finally the scientific significance of uh, the current generation of neutrinoless double beta decay experiments. So the history uh, fits right in with uh, the development of single beta decay theory. Uh, starts with 1930s, uh, 1930 with Pauli's suggestion of a neutrino. 1932, Chadwick discovers a neutron. That was incorporated by Fermi in 34 with his effective theory of beta decay, which was modeled after electromagnetism. And then just in 1935, one year later, uh, Maria Gopert Mayer uh, pointed out that in some nuclei, uh, beta decay might not occur. But there was another process, a second order weak interaction process, where two bound neutrons in a nucleus could decay into two protons emitting uh, two electrons and two of, of uh, Pauli's anti-neutrinos. And then in 1937, two years later, uh, Majorana suggested that possibly uh, a, another description of the neutrino where the neutrino and the anti-neutrino were indistinguishable. That is, that there's no charge to necessarily distinguish those two particles, so they, so they might be identical, that this might be an acceptable theory of Pauli's uh, neutrino. And just, one lay, just that same year, uh, Rocca pointed out that if um, Majorana's new theory could actually be tested, because it would lead to a second form of neutrinoless double beta, uh, of double, a double beta decay, a neutrinoless type. So if we have a nu nucleus with neutrons and protons, then one beta decay can occur and produce a neutrino, and that neutrino is then reabsorbed on another a neutron to produce a final state with two protons and uh, two outgoing electrons. So this is sort of interesting because uh, it has to do with a very fundamental uh, conundrum in uh, labeling the particles of the standard model. All the other st uh, standard model particles have a charge, and that charge has to be additively conserved in all reactions. The neutrino is the only exception. There's no obvious quantum number that you can associate with the neutrino that necessarily changes sign when you uh, look at the neutrino's antiparticle. So that's what makes the question open whether the neutrino has a distinct antiparticle or not. And uh, so how you would think about attacking this problem is to do an experiment. So we do a little Gedanken experiment here. Suppose we have a beta plus source. A beta plus source produces positrons. So you might define the particle that accompanies positrons in beta decay as the neutrino. And then you do an experiment. You put a target. You let that neutrino hit the target. And you find always out, at the other, out the other side comes an electron. So you know that the neutrino produced in positron beta decay, uh, beta plus decay, produces an electron when it hits another target. Now you do a second experiment. You take the, uh, you use this to define the anti-neutrino. It's the particle that's produced when you have a beta minus source, and you let that uh, anti-neutrino uh, then interact with the target, and you find that anti-neutrino always produces a positron. So it appears at this point that these two particles, the neutrino and the anti-neutrino, are distinct because operationally they do different things. The uh, anti-neutrino produces positrons when it hits the target. The neutrino produces electrons. So that in makes you do have to do something to distinguish these two particles, so you have to add a charge. And that charge is lepton number. So we, call, we label the particles by lepton number, and then we require that they be additively conserved in all reactions. So the sum of the lepton numbers going in must be the sums of the electron numbers going out. And uh, the labels we would attach so then to correspond to the experiment that was just done was that the, uh, uh, an electron and a neutrino have positive lepton number, the positron and the anti-neutrino negative lepton number. So uh, this kind of experiment that we just described here was actually done in the laboratory. Uh, one way to do it is to do it directly, and that was actually attempted, uh, done by Ray Davis in the 1950s, where he took anti-neutrinos on his famous chlorine detector at a, uh, a reactor site to see if it would produce any argon, and it did not. And he concluded at the 5% level that the neutrino and anti-neutrino must be distinct. But Rocca's method was even more powerful. It was much more convincing. And it's actually, in a way, much more efficient 
and it depends on really interesting properties of nuclear physics. So what I've shown here are the various isotopes of mass 76 in nuclei, and that's an even uh, t total mass, and then we uh, plot these uh, uh, isotopes as a function of their charge. So if you have an even Z, that corresponds to an even number of protons and an even number of neutrons. If you have an odd Z, that's an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons. Now, if you fit curves to these uh, energetics here, they're, we're plotting the masses, the uh, energies, uh, masses of these uh, ground states. If you plot a curve that uh, fits through the even guys, you find it follows in a sort of a parabola like that. If another fit through the odd guys, you find out that it's shifted upward. And that represents the nuclear pairing force. It costs you energy to break a neutron pair or a proton pair. So all the odd, odd guys are less energetically favored than the even, even isotope. So this happens a lot in the periodic table of the elements. And, and in fact, it has an interesting consequence for beta decay. Because if you try to beta decay uh, germanium-76, it can't. Because the beta decay is an uphill reaction. It's, uh, it requires energy, and there is no energy to give in a decay. But the second order weak decay of germanium to selenium changing to the charge by t uh, two units is allowed. So you have this wonderful nuclear filter that uh, excludes first order weak interactions and isolates the second order weak interaction. It's one of two places in nature where you can directly study the effects of second order, rare second order weak interactions. And uh, it has, it's also very interesting from the question of uh, Maria Gopert's Mayer's uh, two neutrino mode versus Raka's mode because it's rather easy to distinguish the two kinds of double beta decay in the laboratory that you can study in these various sy systems. So particular K here for molybdenum 100 would produce uh, two outgoing electrons. You plot experimentally the sum of the energy of those two electrons. Since in the two neutrino decay, the electrons share the energy with the neutrinos, you get this nice bell-shaped curve here with very little phase space down toward the endpoint. The endpoint is def defined by how much energy released is released in the nuclear decay. But the neutrinos decay is all there as a line, line spread by the experimental resolution. So if you have a detector with great resolution, you can certainly distinguish neutrinoless decay from two neutrino decay by these uh, uh, spectrographic methods. So uh, for, for a Majorana neutrino, this neutrinoless mode, I've just pictured it here, of a parent nucleus changing its charge by two units by emitting and, uh, and absorb, reabsorbing a neutrino. This, two neutri this neutrinoless mode is greatly fa uh, favored by phase space over the, uh, over the two neutrino mode. The uh, neutrinoless mode you'd expect with normal weak interaction strengths would typically give you lifetimes of nuclei of between 10 to the 12 and 10 to the 15 years. And uh, the, while the two neutrino mode is probably suppressed by another six or eight orders of magnitude from there. So even uh, by the time uh, Davis did his experiment, there had been some really uh, uh, elegant uh, efforts on neutrinoless double beta decay. Half-lives had, by the 1950s, early 1950s, been established for isotopes like zirconium, calcium, and cadmium. And they were all found not to be in this range, but in fact 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 17 years. And there was rather an amazing uh, geochemical double beta decay experiment performed for tellurium-130 that actually measured the, a rate for neutrinoless decay. It was found to be 10 to the 21 years. So again, completely inconsistent with neutrinoless decay, but compatible with the expectations for two neutrino decay. And so that says you've done the experiment. And indeed, uh, you don't seem to see the neutrinoless uh, process, nor did Ray see uh, anti-neutrinos uh, producing argon in his chlorine de detector, so you have to add the lepton number to explain the experiments that you see. And so you put a little dot there that says that the anti-neutrino that's producing the electron is just the wrong neutrino to push the second step, so this process no longer words, works, and you've been introduced this conserved charge. This is the only standard model fermion where these questions arise because all the other standard model fermions have a charge, and so we know that they have distinct antiparticles. The problem with this argument, and I'm giving you the, the arguments as they appeared historically, is it makes an implicit assumption about the neutrino, particularly about the neutrino helicity, which is uh, connected to the question also of whether the neutrino is really a massless particle. So uh, even in the 1920s, a parity was already used in physics, it was, uh, was used to classify atomic transitions in, uh, uh, in uh, atomic transitions and wave functions. 
1957, as Hamish described, Li and Yang uh, simulated a number of experiments that were uh, to uh, test uh, uh, parity, uh, parity in, uh, in a weak interaction, including this amazing experiment he went through by Gold, uh, Goldhaber, uh, Grodzin, and Sunyar. And they found not only that parity was violated, but it was violated maximally, and so that the neutrinos and anti-neutrinos coming out in beta decay are left-handed and right-handed. So if parity violation is maximal and neutrinos are massless, then you have a helicity label that you can attach to the neutrinos. And that has a profound consequence. We needed a lepton number because we had to explain why that anti-neutrino couldn't be reabsorbed in the second case. And that is, of course, one way to forbid that process. If we insist that we don't have uh, Dirac particles, but Majorana particles, particles that are identical to their anti-particles, we thought that that rate would go like the fourth power of the weak interaction and be relatively fast in conflict with experiment. But now we've discovered that these neutrinos come out of beta decay with a helicity label. And so the fact that this neutrino is a right-handed neutrino is enough to forbid the decay because it is left-handed neutrinos, not right-handed neutrinos, that can induce the second reaction to produce the second electron. So this is exactly forbidden uh, for massless neutrinos because of the helicity uh, label. So it's too bad because you had this lovely test to dis distinguish between uh, the Majorana Dirac character of neutrinos, whether there's this conserved lepton number, and you found you're thwarted because of this maximal parity violation. We don't need lepton number. So this is why in this current la last uh, 15 years, there's been so much excitement about double beta decay because this argument also is wrong. And it's wrong because we've discovered that neutrinos have mass. And so if a neutrino has mass, is a mass, we can always jump into a boosted frame and turn around the helicity because we can flip the uh, a mo a momentum vector from uh, a, a left going to right going. So that tells you that in any uh, theory that is uh, covariant with a mass of neutrinos, this, this, for, this uh, helicity label is no longer a completely legitimate label for the neutrinos. It's only appro approximate. And so when you do the calculation for this process with right-handed and left-handed neutrinos, you find it's not exactly forbidden, but just suppressed. And the suppression relative to the strength of the weak interaction is as the square of the neutrino mass uh, to, uh, to the typical neutrino energy in this process. And that's something on the order of the inverse nuclear size, something on the order of 50 MeV. So this process is only uh, uh, inhibited by the, by the helicity selection rule, uh, not abs absolutely forbidden. And so it's really interesting that, in particular, if the mass of the neutrino is a Majorana mass, it plays two roles. It removes the helicity uh, as an exact label for the neutrino states, and it provides the source of lepton number violation we need to have this process go. And uh, so you can kind of summarize all these arguments in some nice pictures. And uh, this was cribbed from one of uh, Boris Kaiser's uh, very nice lectures. So you can think of the two possibilities for neutrinos. And we should think of these as uh, two limits. Uh, the Majorana case, in the Majorana case, you have an elect, a left-handed neutrino, and they know that under boost that must turn into a right-handed neutrino if you assume that the neutrino is massive. But the same pair of neutrinos plays the, sa uh, the same partnership role under the CPT operation that changes particle to antiparticle. Alternatively, if you have a lepton number and therefore two distinct particles, a particle and its antiparticle, labeled by lepton number, then the same partnerships occur under boost, but different guys are linked under the CPT operation that changes particles to antiparticles. So you've got these two possibilities for this, describing the neutrino, and in fact, it's not just these two possibilities, but since whatever's uh, not forbidden is allowed, you'd actually expect that both of these guys appear in nature, and that this, the neutrino is probably some linear combination of th these two possibilities with both Majorana and uh, and uh, a Dirac character. It's actually kind of fun to go back to the textbook and write down the Dirac equation, because that's what we all, how we learned about neutrinos initially, and to make it ugly instead of the pretty way that it appears in textbook. And so instead of work, worrying with the, working with the four component Dirac spinner that is always introduced, we can instead project out its left and right handed degrees of freedom, as well as its two charge degrees of freedom. So we've taken a four component spinner and explicitly written it out. We can actually do something more than that. We can know that there are three kinds of neutrinos, and so we could actually take these, uh, these uh, fields and replace them by fields that actually have three labels corresponding to their flavors. 
And if you do that, you find out that the Dirac equation, buried in, under the Dirac equation, is a particular form for the mass matrix that's shown here, where you have these two, two four projections of this original spinner written out explicitly. Now they become actually uh, matrices and flavor spaces, and these are the Dirac terms, and the Dirac equation tells you that all four of these mass terms are the same. And you see immediately some of those zeros have to be there because they have to do with left-handed and right-handed fields dotting against one another, and therefore they have to be zero. But there are a couple of blanks in there that don't have to be there. So we made an assumption in writing down the Dirac equation. And in fact, we should add new terms to the mass matrix to actually try to fill those up. And so that's, that are, those are done here, and those are the two uh, Majorana forms. So this mass matrix that you would write down, it's a natural thing you would do if you just started off on a clean piece of paper and wrote down the most general thing you could construct for the neutrino mass matrix, it would be a 4n by 4n matrix, where n is, a, is the uh, a number of flavors in the theory, and four are, uh, of course, the four components of the Dirac equation. And this matrix has a lot of interesting uh, properties. It's just a linear algebra exercise to go ahead and diagonalize this. And when you do diagonalize it, you find that there are two n uh, Majorana spinners, two component spinners that are the uh, eigenvectors. And you also find that there's an invariance that's uh, broken when you add these new terms. That invariance is that if you take the wave function to make a simple, the field to make a simple phase transformation, uh, this interaction here is invariant, but it's broken when you add either one of these two terms. And that's the invariance that's actually associated with this uh, conserved lepton number. So it's really interesting with that mass matrix, you just pl plug away, you can calculate in that uh, neutrinoless process what is the, uh, what is the mass that's uh, mediating that tr uh, transition, that is, what is the non-zero amplitude. And it turns out it's proportional to the sums over all the neutrino mass eigenstates, since a neutrino is produced and then reabsorbed, all the, mass, all the possible mass eigenstates will contribute to the, over that sum. It's weighted by the couplings of the various mass eigenstates, pro probability of their coupling to the electron. And there's a phase that appears in here, which if CP is conserved, turns out to be the relative CP eigenvalues of the mass eigenstates. And now you can play some games about asking what happens in that mass matrix if you uh, do various things to it. For example, we can recover our familiar Dirac limit by setting these Majorana components uh, equal to zero. And then it turns out that since we had uh, this 4n by 4n matrix, and, and uh, we argued that there's this helicity uh, 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 coupling two components are having to do with spin, we expect to get uh, six uh, eigenvalues out of that matrix. But in fed, said what we find out here is we get the six eigenstates, but they're twofold degenerate. So when you see this pattern, each of these states represents actually two of the two component spinners. You can package them together to recover a four component spinner and make up the Dirac equation. And when you do that, you find out if you go back to the mass that's uh, tested in double beta decay, that the pairs of neutrinos in each of these states exactly cancel in that sum to give you a zero uh, a mass, of effective mass for neutrinoless double beta decay. Dirac neutrinos don't mediate double beta decay. You can imagine a scenario where the Dirac mass is large and the Majorana masses are small, and just like you'd expect then, you have a hyperfine structure. You break that degeneracy, and then again, you can calculate what the double beta decay mass is, and the double beta decay mass is proportional to the splittings, not to the actual physical masses that you might measure in the laboratory. So it's subtle. The mass that you measure in double beta decay is different from the kinematic masses that you might see, for example, in the beta decay experiments that Hamish described. And finally, this is the most interesting scenario in many ways. Suppose it's the other way around, that the Dirac mass is small and the Majorana uh, masses are, are dominant. In fact, what we think is really interesting, because we have some experimental hints about this, is we think the Majorana mass is quite large and the left-handed uh, the right-handed Majorana mass is large and the left-handed Majorana mass is small. And then you find out that these six states essentially decouple with the right-handed guys going up here and the left-handed guys being, making up our familiar uh, light neutrinos. And then when we calculate our beta de decay mass, it's dominated by these light guys down here. And just as the sum over three states, not six, uh, according to their coupling probabilities and masses. This is what we call the standard scenario in double beta decay, um, largely dominated by Majorana masses, with three of those neutrino masses being light. And uh, there are really strong reasons for ex expecting, uh, in fact, both Dirac and Majorana masses. Um, we would like to give the neutrino a mass, and we'd like it to fit into the standard model in some natural way. And since we have all these other Dirac masses for all of the other fermions, it would be natural for the neutrino to have a Dirac mass 
similar to that to the, uh, that of the other fermions. We actually know that the Majorana mass must, left-handed Majorana mass, mass must be small because that's the guy that generates double beta decay. We've got pretty, pretty good limits on double beta decay. We don't see any right-handed physics at low energy, so it's natural to assume the right-handed scale is much larger than the Dirac scale. And so if we take our little mass matrix and write down this simple cartoon of it in, in one dimension and go ahead and diagonalize it, you discover that the light eigenstate that comes from the diagonalizing this matrix is proportional to M Dirac, which is the standard scale for all the other fermions, and N times a parameter is the ratio of MD over MR. So this is what you want to explain something that you see when you look at the masses of the particles, the fact that the neutrinos are so much lighter than all the other standard model particles. You've identified a small, potentially a small parameter, the ratio of the Dirac mass to the right-handed mass scale that might account for the small neutrino masses we see in nature. And the reason everybody was so excited in, uh, in 1998 when uh, neutrino mass was finally discovered was that you can now plug in the numbers in this formula. You, you can take as an estimate of the light neutrino mass the square of the atmospheric mass difference that was seen. You can take, since that's a heavy neutrino, probably a heavy neutrino, then you associate with the Dirac scale, the top quark mass, and you plug in and you can sol solve for MR. And what you find is that MR turns out to be around uh, 10 to the 15 GeV. So it's a scale very close to the gut scale. So this, this mechanism, the so-called seesaw mechanism, is extremely attractive because it gives you an appealing explanation for the anomalous scale of neutrino masses. And what it requires is both Dirac and Majorana masses appearing in the neutrino mass matrix. And there's a lovely synthesis of all of this that my colleague uh, Hitoshi Murayama wrote down. So he describes the standard model up here where we have masses generated by particles fermions scattering off the Higgs, and the neutrino has no way of scattering off the Higgs, so it's just flying along massless, and the electron, the muon, and, and tauon become heavier and heavier because they scatter more and more often. And now you can add new fix physics. If you want to add a direct neutrino mass in the standard model, then you've got it, since the neutrinos in the standard model are just left-handed, you've got to introduce a partner, a right-handed guy, to allow the same kind of scattering to occur with the neutrino, and then you generate this, this light neutri direct uh, neutrino mass. And likewise, if you want to create a Majorana mass, it turns out you can't do that. That's a left-handed, left-handed component, unless you jump up to some scale and jump back down. That, this is the one over M, that M corresponds to our right-handed neutrino mass. So this turns out to be something that's, uh, that's not mathematically acceptable in the standard model, unless you treat the standard model as an effective theory. So it's some kind of physics at a new uh, energy scale that's not in there in the standard model, but that we can introduce phenomenologically in the way we've done this. And if you do both of these things, then you can understand this pattern that sits down here. So this uh, observation of neutrinos double beta decay actually implies neutrino mass. It's not just one, it works both ways. If you take the diagram, for neutrino with double beta decay and just rearrange it, you wind up having this little black box of Valley and Schechter that generates a neutrino mass for, the, uh, for a mass for the neutrino. So this works for almost all theories. Now, why this field is now really excited is that we not only know that mass, neutrinos are massive, but we've got awful lot of parameters uh, de defined in, in that mass matrix. We also know that we have these two patterns of possible um, masses for the neutrinos, normal and inverted. We know all of the uh, non-zero entries, all the entries in these matrices for the transformation between mass and flavor eigenstates, except the three Majorana phases. And we actually know them all uh, relatively well uh, today. Really beautiful analyses that have synthesized all the results from the various experiments. And so when we go up and try to calculate this double beta decay mass, we can do so. And we can look at it in the various, with, the, with the various three schemes. That, uh, that are suggested by, um, by that mass matrix. We can look at the normal hierarchy. We can look at this inverted hierarchy where the, where the solar pair is up high and the, and the uh, uh, lightest neutrino is approximately zero. Or we can look at the quasi-degenerate case and that there's a gap between our three neutrinos where the gap is constrained now most stringently by cosmology to be somewhere under 200 milli electron volts. And then we can take those and plot them on a graph to tell us what kind of double beta decay mass we'll measure as a function of the minimum neutrino mass, that is the smallest mass of, in, in either one of those three patterns. And we can go back in and actually plug in the numbers to find out what we ought to try to, what we should be trying to measure. <coughs> 
So if we had this normal hierarchy, it turns out, when we plug in the numbers for all of the, uh, uh, the mixing angles with this one unknown phase, that we get a scale on the order of 4.8 milli electron volts. And we do the inverted hierarchy uh, because we've got uh, at, uh, two, two neutrinos that are higher, we find out that we get something on the order of, uh, of uh, 30 milli electron volts for the scale of double beta decay. And if we had this quasi-degenerate case, then it's constrained only by cosmology, and we know it's something on, on the order of 200 milli electron volts or, or less. Now, today we're going through a, a really interesting phase of what are called sort of demonstrator experiments. Uh, there's ex experiments that are gearing up for something really big at the, in, during the second half of this decade. whole set of them that here, Gerda, uh, Exo, the Majorana demonstrator, Quarry, Snowplus, Next, Superdemo and Kamlan Zen, picking various isotopes like germanium, uh, 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 xenon, and, uh, and uh, tellurium. And this uh, chart compiled by the NSAC Committee on Neutrinos Double Beta Decay shows the construction periods and the operation periods for these demonstrator experiments. And uh, they're pictured, few, few examples are pictured here. Uh, uh, Gerda, uh, uh, located in Grand Sasso, it's established already a limit on the half-life of 2 times 10 to the 25 years. Uh, EXO uh, mounted down a whip using xenon. It's established a limit of 1.1 times 10 to the 25 years for the neutrinoless decay. And CAM lens in 1.9 times 10 to the 25 years operating in Kamioka. Again, introducing xenon into its detector. And so you can go back to that the set of goals that we have there and write down what, what are the possibilities. So already with the current five-year demonstrator experiments that are going on, they have the capacity to reach a lifetime of about 1 times 1.6 times 10 to the 26 years. So already they're reaching this uh, interesting realm that's uh, set by uh, current cosm cosmology limits on neutrino mass. If you want to think about testing the inverted hierarchy, the level of lepton number corresponding to an inverted hierarchy, then you quickly calculate that you're going to need a ton plus experiments uh, experiments capable of, of approaching uh, uh, several times 10 to the 27, perhaps even 10 to the 28 years. And finally, if you want this daunting goal of reaching the Majorana masses characteristic of the normal hierarchy, you have to get to a lifetime limit of about 5 times 10 to the 29 years. But it's really an extraordinary situation because there are compelling reasons for believing that there are Majorana masses, and you can actually write down from what we know what experiments have to be constructed at what level to actually see a lepton number violation. And in particular, uh, the, uh, this intermediate scale of uh, one ton experiments that the field expects to start launching or start uh, thinking about constructing in 2017 should have the reach to, to test this, uh, this uh, mass scale that corresponds to the inverted hierarchy. So two examples, this is the Majorana demonstrator here. Majorana and Gerda, the corresponding germanium experiment in Europe, plan to get together they, using two different technologies right now in the demonstrator phase. They'll try to figure out which of those technologies is most successful and use that in a combined uh, uh, US um, uh, uh, European experiment uh, in a, a one ton or rich germanium uh, 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 76 detector. And likewise, EXO uh, currently operating down in WIP would like to go to the NXO stage, which might begin at the one ton level and eventually even get to the five ton level to reach the same sorts of sensitivities of uh, 10 to the 28 years. And we know what we have to do, and maybe no experiment right now knows it can do all of these things, but you need excellent resolution to make sure you can just see the neutrinolistic decay in the back, uh, in a, in a um, background of two neutrino decay. You have to have essentially uh, det large detectors that are nearly free of backgrounds. The costs have to be feasible. It's wonderful if you have final state tagging of some sort and you'd like your technology be, be scalable so that you could eventually even get to this normal hierarchy level. Now, I've talked up to this point about the standard me mechanism. The standard mechanism has to do with light, nutrient, light m masses, and so the matrix element's proportional to the mass. But there are also really other interesting mechanisms in the field. Uh, there's, a, is, there's a possibility that it's the heavy right-handed neutrino that's important, and in fact, you can calculate this guy. Turns out that that matrix element's inversely proportional to the mass of neutrinos. So already, if we get to this 20, 10 to the 27 year level, it turns out the kinds of scales we're testing in terms of couplings and, uh, and, and, uh, and the masses of these heavy neutrinos with 10 to the 27 year experiments is at the 10 to the, 10 to the 5 TeV level. 
You can introduce all sorts of interesting left and right-handed currents in, uh, in lepton number violating interactions that have nothing to do with mass, at least explicitly. And finally, to actually calculate what you have to measure, you have to do the nuclear physics. And the nuclear physics in these cases have some matrix elements that appear to be benign, simple spin flip and isospin uh, changing operators with a kind of a Coulombic behavior of one over R. So you think they might be easy to calculate. Unfortunately, these transitions from ground state to ground state are incredibly exclusive. That is, almost all the strength associated with these matrix elements goes to states that are not physically accessible. And so what you actually measure corresponds to perhaps uh, one-tenth of one percent of a sum rule. In a nuclear physics, calculating something that sensitive is extremely difficult. So the results that you, you get, the projections that you have for what kinds of experiments you do, depends on the nuclear physics. It depends not only on the quality of the nuclear calculation explicitly, but all sorts of phenomenological corrections that we know have to be introduced that account for missing physics, such as absent high momentum uh, degrees of freedom and poorly understood operator renormalizations. All this, unfortunately, has to be model-based. Uh, there are substantial physics differences between what we can measure, which is the two neutrino process, and what we'd like to measure, the neutrinoless process. So even though we know lots of two neutrino rates today, they're of limited use in actually defining the nuclear physics. Despite of all the challenges, it looks to me like the nuclear physicists have done a pretty good job. Typically, there's about a factor of three discrepancy between various model calculations, but in nuclear physics, uh, that's not that bad agreement. Unfortunately, a factor of three uh, discrepancy in matrix element corresponds to many dollars in a one-ton experiments, many perhaps $100 million in some experiments. So it's a very big deal to try to improve the nuclear physics and make them more certain. However, there are always model calculations, so it's hard to define what you mean by an error bar. But just typically, if you look at variations among calculations for the various isotopes, the variations are not too bad. And the differences between different isotopes also are not, that, are not so extreme. So such calculations are used to establish that you need these lifetimes, after it reaches these lifetimes of a few to 10 times 10 to the 27 years to really uh, test this inverted hierarchy range. So in summary, uh, the primary motivation for double beta decay is to demonstrate the violation of one of physics' most sacred symmetries, which is lepton number. This is a really important symmetry. If you discover a lepton number, it may help you unravel one of the major puzzles in physics is why our universe contains matter. If you introduce a, a net lepton number early in the evolution of our universe, it could convert through standard quantum mechanics into a net baryon number and therefore account for the the uh, baryon, uh, anti-baryon, baryon number asymmetry. It's also thought that the pattern of fermion masses requires not only the Higgs, but something beyond the standard model, and really the leading candidate is the seesaw mechanism, which requires these right-handed uh, Majorana neutrinos, and indicates that maybe it's associated with physics at the gut scale. And finally, uh, our quest to probe this physics is not a shot in the dark. It's unlike many other uh, searches for uh, very rare events. There are two well-defined targets that are defined by uh, the experiments that uh, we've done and uh, other neutrino experiments we've done. And one, the inverted hierarchy appears to be within reach of uh, next decade experiments. So the experimentalists ought to get to it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Wick. Very nice talk. Uh, we have time for questions. And come to the uh, microphone here in the center. So let's say you get a non-zero signal. Because there are various mechanisms, as you said, beyond it being the simple Majorana and neutrino, how do you distinguish or different isotopes give you different? Yeah, it's difficult with most of the experiments that, to distinguish uh, mechanisms based on the experiments. Maybe the one exception, though, is that you can learn something if you have a sensitivity to the final state. So there's at least one experiment uh, today that's beginning to think about doing tracking. So in the decay, you see the two electron spectrum. So that gives you information on, first, what is that spectrum? And uh, that is the individual single spectrum. And what's the opening angle distribution? And that does depend uh, on mechanism. So it's one handle we have. 
So I wonder what are the prospects of uh, improving the uh, nuclear physics calculation of these matrix elements? I mean, uh, especially how you're going to control the systematic errors. So what? Yeah, it's the problem about nuclear physics is that um, most of the calculations we do are, are done in models, and how they should be uh, thought about are they're not the ray function that we obtain from these models. We obtain, obtain some uh, low momentum projection of the wave function. Uh, so there, those projections are uh, very useful for um, uh, predicting the properties of lots of uh, soft, low energy operators. But double beta decay is a little tricky. It's got some sensitivity to short range physics. So we have to mock them up by uh, putting in correlation functions that, just, that replace the existing wave functions with something more singular at small distances. And you have to worry, because it's an effective wave function, that the operators also have to be renormalized. And I think the latter is actually the biggest source of uncertainties in, in these calculations right now. It's uncontrolled. We don't have any experimental tests of what the effective operators have to, has to, have to be. So one thing that several of us are thinking about in the field is that although we can't do exact calculations for any of these heavy isotopes that are relevant, you can do exact calculations for lighter systems, which although they don't physically double beta decay, you can still test the same matrix elements. So perhaps a program where we learn about the relationship between single beta decay, two neutrino decay, and neutrinoless decay from these sort of um, ab initio light nuclei might be useful in figuring out what happens for the uh, heavier systems of interest. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that if you experimentally observe neutrinoless double beta decay, even though you may not know the exact relationship relative to the mass, you'll know you've discovered uh, that neutrinos are Majorana and that lepton numbers violate it. But then trying to, to extract the mass, that's the more model-dependent issue. Yeah. Of course, for such hard experiments, you'd like to see it in a, in a couple of nuclei. Uh, is there a final question? Okay. Uh, when Professor Shadwick has bombarded the brillium by alpha particles, only nitrons released. Why not protons? Why not electrons? According to Einstein, mass energy equation, the bending energy of nitrons is the higher inside the atom. I mean proton bending energy and the nitron bending energy, uh, electron bending energy is less than nitron bending energy. This is number one. Number two, if protons and the nitrons are compacted inside the nucleus. When the nitrons will be released, there will be a big collision between protons inside the atom's nucleus. This is over. Also, Mr. Professor Sudi Vajan confirmed another that, okay, that's right, okay, thank you. Thank you for the comments. All right, let's like work again.